those negatives are going to come back to bite you in the behind if you don't deal with them. When you get to the ask about uh, the contract, moving forward with the negotiation, those things are going to pop up. And you want to think, well, you know, I thought we were past that. Well, no, you weren't. We didn't address it. Troy, <clears throat> Troy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can we step back a little bit? We've had uh, sure. a few questions about it versus you. Could okay. you um, explain the usage of it versus you? Okay. It is neutral. And when you're dealing with it, it's, it's a lot easier. You tell somebody, it seems like. Now, you're not saying that it, that's the way it is. If somebody gets pissed off, they're going to say, well, that's not really what it is. So I didn't say that's what it is. It's, I said it seems like it, it may, you may be in, in a difficult position. Now, when you say you, it's saying you know they're in a difficult. You're in a difficult position. You just made it more personal. It is neutral. You is going to be more engaging. It's more personal. If you're not saying using the you appropriately, or if you're not sure, uh, you want to stick with the it in the beginning. If you're using you, people, and you say it wrong, people are going to get offended and think that you're accusing them of something. Did that help? We like to tell everybody you want to have a go-to list of labels. What are the go-to list of labels? It sounds like this is important to you. When you're in a conversation with somebody and they're telling you their story and they're telling you what's going on, you hit them with, it sounds like this is important to you. And they're going to tell you why it's important. If they're struggling with something and, and you're trying to get more information, man, it looks like you've given us a lot of thought. If you're getting near the end of the negotiation or conversation and you haven't had any luck, or you're struggling with something and they seem like they don't want to, they don't want to bend, they're not flexible enough yet, and you think this is basically the end of the conversation, you can hit them with one. It seems like there's nothing I can do to change your mind. And one of our biggest go-tos, and we can use it in almost any situation, especially if they're if you've hit them with a label and they come back with a question for you, and it seems like you have a reason for saying that or thinking that or feeling that, and they'll keep right on talking. They'll explain themselves. They'll tell you why they said what they said because people do not ask good questions. What happens if you get it wrong? Every time we have one of these classes, people go, well, what if I get it wrong? Now I just, I blew it. No, you didn't blow it. We talk about the laws of negotiation gravity. The desire to correct is irresistible. People can't wait to correct you. First of all, like I said, when you're saying the label, you're not saying for certain that's what the label is. What you're doing when, you, when you're using the label, you're asking for confirmation. The good thing about what happens is if you get it wrong, like we said, the desire to correct is irresistible and they're going to correct you with the truth. People are going to love to point out that you got something wrong. And they're probably going to give you more information or tell you things that they didn't mean to tell you because of it. We call that a mislabel. So it can be done on purpose to get more candid, honest response. Sometimes people go, oh, yeah, that's that's like a lie detector test. Right. One thing we want to caution you about mislabeling is if you do it too many times in a conversation, people start to think you're not paying attention and they're gonna get upset. They're gonna get angry. 
if you're genuinely mislabeled, you got it wrong and, you, and you're you going to say it like that, it's going to come across and they're going to they're going to want to help you. They're going to want to correct you. But if they see that you're constantly doing it, they're starting to realize, you know what, this person's not paying attention to me. They're wasting my day. They're wasting my time. And how would you mislabel if you see someone's frustrated? It doesn't seem like you're frustrated. When clearly you can see that they are and they're going to correct you. Hell yeah, I'm frustrated. I'm pissed. You know, I don't know why you would even say that I'm not frustrated. I'm so upset right now that I can't, I'm beside myself. And then they'll tell you why. You know, I've been stuck in this negotiation and my boss want me to get this done. And this, how long has it taken? We've been doing this for a month. Labeling is the best way to find out the unknown unknowns. What does that mean? When y'all go into a negotiation, what happens? You go in there, you don't put all your cards on the table. You keep things close to the vest. So is your counterpart. They're going to keep things close to the vest that they, that they think you need to know or some things that they don't even know they, that's guarded and other things that may be blind. They don't even know that it's something that you that would help you along the negotiation. So labeling is the best way to get that information out of them. That's what we call the black swans. And guess what happens when you have a one black swan? They, they, I used to say packs, but they, they travel in flocks. You're going to find two or three. They're going to start to reveal themselves and they're going to be game changers for you in the negotiation or the conversation. Now, what's the next one? We talk about mirrors. Mirrors, all that is, is repeating back the last one to three words. No, normally no more than five. And if you're good at it, you could do it anywhere in a conversation. But mirrors are used if you're having a difficult time coming up with a label. If you're listening to your counterpart and you can't think of a label in the moment, you want to mirror the last one to three words. It's a good way to keep the conversation going. It's a good way to build rapport. Let the counterpart know that you're listening, you're paying attention, that you're engaged, you're involved. Uh, you're repeating back things that just came out of their mouth. They know you're listening. And you can make the content, you can make a mirror, a question or a statement. You do that by your inflection. Downward inflection means you understand. One to three words. If you use upward inflection or the inquisitive inflection, it means you need, you need more inf information. One to three words. So depending on how you make the how you use your inflection in the context, you're going to be able to get more information. You're either going to acknowledge that you get it, or you're going to say, "Hey, I need help. I'm not understanding what you're saying." The good thing about using mirrors is if you go through the conversation and there's somewhere that you really kind of want to direct them, you can go back to one of the sentences that they've used previously in that conversation, and you can hit one to three words anywhere in that conversation, and it's not going to throw them off because They've already, this is their conversation. They're listening. They're hearing things that they've already started talking about. So you're not throwing them off base. You're just guiding them down the path that you want them to go. I always laugh about this because I'm a clown. I like to joke. I'm not mirroring body language or feelings. But I told you all about the two ladies feeling the, the the sympathy, feeling what you're feeling. Oh, you know, I had a headache. Oh, I have a headache. Yeah. Everything that this other person's feeling, now you're feeling it. You're not trying to get common ground. And it's definitely not labeling or mirroring the body language. So, I'm talking to Alan, Alan's talking to me. Alan does this, I do this.
Alan scratched his head. I scratched my head. I used to see people do that and I start playing games with them. I would forget about negotiating. It would become a game almost like Simon says. I would reach across, touch my ear, touch my nose different times and see how many times the other person was doing it. And if you came back and asked me what was going on in the conversation, I probably couldn't tell you because I was so busy trying to count how many times I convinced them by using body language to make them do something that they, that they didn't even realize they were doing. So you don't want to mirror the body language. 